Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. This is part two of how to check if your torque wrench is still in spec. Honestly, that would have been a much better title for the first video. I may or may not have used the word calibrate a bit too lightly. Anyway, I suspected the word cheap in the title was a clear giveaway, uh, but anyway, that video gained a lot of insightful comments and questions which I want to address in this video. Now, this channel is usually about working on my expensive project car with cheap tools, so this video is aimed at home mechanics who want to check if their Harbor Freight slash Princess Auto torque wrench is still somewhat in spec. This video consists of two parts. The first part is about the torque wrench itself and about the inspection procedure. The second part is about torquing, and I'll tell you a story from my day job about, a, about an expensive torque wrench causing an expensive engine damage. Oh. Welcome to all new subscribers, and thanks for all the likes and comments. It really made my day. All that attention made my trusty old cheap torque wrench a bit shy, so I'm using Junior as his stand-in. Now, one frequently asked question was about the formula I used. Uh, well, torque is the result of a force applied to an arm, over here. The arm is the lever of your torque wrench, and the force is applied to the grip by your hand by pushing it. Since I'm born blue-eyed, right-handed and metric, all measurements in this video are in newtons and in meters, but you can simply exchange them to pounds and feet for your convenience. Heck, you can even mix them up and apply newtons to feet and pounds to meters. Since we're checking a cheaper type of torque wrench, we can't expect it to be accurate throughout its entire range. That's why I check my torque wrench in the range that I use most. In part 1 that was about 126 newton meters mid-range of the torque wrench, and for this video with this smaller torque wrench that's about 70 newton meters. Um, a lot of commenters uh, pointed out that I should have attached the scale to the bend of the grip, which is this smooth spot in the knurled part of the grip. And I applied the scale to the end of the grip itself. So, lessons learned, I'm going to measure the distance from the pivot point to this, this band over here, which is 21 and a half centimeters. Now, on to the mathematics. Um, Mid-range is in this, in this case 70 newton meters. Not sure if the camera will pick it up. Also, there's a Foot pound scale on the back, newton meters is on the front in this case. So, onto the mathematics. 70 newton meters is the result of a yet unknown force applied to the arm of 21 and a half centimeters. I'll bring the formula in screen here. Now, here are the mathematics. I have to apply a force of 325.6 newton meters on the grip to reach 70 newton meters of torque over there. That's about 32 and a half kilos, but if I want to precise, I have to take in account that 10 newton do not, does not equate to 1 kilo. In my workshop, 1 kilo equ equals 9.81 newton. So if I want to weigh that in, the force I have to apply is 33.14 kilos. Uh, I leave a link to in the description to an online torque calculator for your convenience. Now in the previous video I showed you how I checked my scale, but that was for demonstration purposes only. If you want to add in more precision, uh, I would take a reference weight in this case of about 30 kilos, the weight I need to apply to the band over here, and adjust my scale to that. I'm going to assume that my scale is still correct, so I'll clamp my torque wrench in my vise, and use this aluminium jaws to prevent it from damaging. Now, another thing I learned is that I have to work the wrench prior to measuring. I'll do that by using a slightly lower torque setting. It's 40 newton meters right now, and I'll click it five times clockwise and five times counterclockwise. Now, it doesn't click counterclockwise, but anyway, that's good. Now after that I'll set my torque wrench to the desired torque, which is 70 newton meters. 
And please note that when you're adjusting your torque wrench, you should always pass the desired setting. In this case, I'm raising the setting, so I'm going to 80 and then back it down to 70 where it is right now. Now with the torque wrench all set and ready, I'm going to attach it to this little part where you normally apply force and pull it. And as expected, it clicks at 33 kilos. Now keep in mind this one is brand new, it doesn't require any calibration, but now I know that is it is accurate in the range that I'm going to use it. So this is basically the procedure you can follow to check if your torque wrench is still in spec. If you want to be really thorough, you can repeat this procedure on a lower and a higher setting. But as I said, I don't expect this type of wrench to be accurate throughout its entire range. I just need to know if it's accurate in the range that I'm using it in. Now, for demonstration purposes, I'm going to show you how to access the adjustment screw. And the adjustment screw is inside the knurled grip here. Uh, the set screw turns with the grip as long as this lock nut is in place. And the set screw pushes onto the spring inside that clicks the clicking mechanism in here. Now to prevent any damage to my torque wrench, I'm going to use these soft grips. Loosen the lock screw. And then loosen this lock nut, which wasn't super tight. Remove the lock screw and then remove the lock nut. Now, as you can see here, there are two small holes in the set screw and you can, and can adjust it with circlip pliers. Rotate it clockwise to increase the spring tension when your wrench clicks too early and rotate it counterclockwise if your wrench clicks too late. Usually half a turn is sufficient to get your torque wrench in spec. Um, now you can test your wrench without installing the lock nut. Once you're sure everything is in spec, you can reinstall the lock nut and lock screw. Just make sure you don't rotate the grip while you're testing your torque wrench. Well, there's that. This is how you check and adjust your cheap torque wrench. One of the most mentioned things in the comments in the previous video is to unwind your torque wrench after use. And I normally lower it to its lower settings and I agree with the commenters I should have mentioned that so now it can go back in its box okay we've arrived at part two of this video this part will be about torquing at least the basics of it I've been a technical writer for over 20 years and I've written many workshop and assembly manuals. So how do technical writers come up with all these torque specs? Well, there's a few things we have to keep in mind. In fact, there are four. One, I often use the specifications supplied by the manufacturer of the bolts and nuts. If you know the thread specifications like pitch and diameter, the grade and the material of the bolt is just copy paste from the manufacturer's specifications. Two. When using lightweight alloys and metals, I determine the torque specs by feel. Tighten the bolt until it's good and tight, and then measure the breakout torque, and I used that number in the manual. 3. For mating surfaces, like cylinder heads and brake rotors, it's necessary to tighten the fasteners in a specific order and sequence. 4. If there is a so-called chemical load, like road salt and cleaning agents, you might want to use an anti-seize compound. Now, to start with the leather, when you're using an anti-seize compound or any other form of lubrication, the friction in the threads and under the head of your bolt decreases. In effect, you will need to apply less force on your wrench to obtain the same clamping force of your bolt. So you have to lower the torque required. 
Now to accurately calculate the clamping force, you need to measure the angle of rotation. And that's why stretch bolts always have an angle of rotation specified. Uh, more on that later in this video. I think it's important for any mechanic to learn to tighten fasteners by feel. With that I mean, you know when tight is tight enough. Or in US German, gut und tight. But even then, it can be important to be consistent, so that the part that you are assembling is evenly tightened around the perimeter. For example, valve covers and oil sumps. They are usually made out of lighter or thinner material, and to prevent leaking, I use a torque wrench to make sure all bolts are evenly tightened. In my days as a technical writer, I often went to the engineering department, and we assembled a certain part. And we use the good and tight standard when tighten bo tightening bolts. Now, to put a number on a torque value, we just got out a torque wrench and measured the breakout torque. And that's the value I use in a workshop manual. To conclude this video, I wanted to share a story from my day job. A couple of years ago, I got a call from an insurance company to investigate a damaged engine. And this is the backstory. A one man workshop had installed a new cylinder head and timing chain kit on a 1.4 engine in a Volkswagen. The timing chains in these engines are known to stretch and they can cause severe em engine damage. Um, that had been the case on this Golf and it damaged all the pistons and there was no undamaged valve to be found in the cylinder head. Now the engine in this case uh, received new pistons with improved oil scraper rings and a brand new cylinder head. And the mechanic used a name brand timing chain kit and the company that supplied this kit was insured by my client. And the workshop used all necessary specialty tools, including a name brand, very expensive torque wrench with an angle rotation measuring system. Plus, it was recently calibrated. Now, I found no reason to question the workmanship and the qualities of this mechanic. He'd done a good job. But in these engines, the camshaft sprockets are mounted onto the camshaft by a stretch bolt. There are no splines, keyways, or nor is there any taper. The sprocket is held in place by the clamping force of the bolt alone. Not the best design if you ask me, but hey, it is what it is. Now, with the help of a special tool, they hold the camshafts and they set the crankshaft position to get the timing in order, and then you tighten the bolt. First in two steps, by tightening to a torque, and then the final step is a 135 degrees of rotation measured by the torque wrench itself. It's a very sophisticated one. Now the mechanic performed all these steps according to the manual and used all the correct tools. But then disaster struck. Upon first start, the bolt and the exhaust camshaft snapped, uh, the crankshaft and camshaft timing were off, and everything inside the engine were damaged. Again, the engine didn't even run, it didn't even start. And as you can see, the timing chain is still dry, the engine didn't make it even to full, to full rotation, and it didn't even build up oil pressure. Now that also means that the mechanic didn't check his work by rotating the crankshaft by hand. Anyway, you can understand that this mechanic had some sleepless nights, but he figured that the bolt must have had some sort of material fault, and he called his part supplier, which in turn called their insurance company, who in turn called me. So, I visited the workshop and I checked everything, including the bolt and the torque wrench. Now, to be sure as can be, we send the bolt off to a lab. There is this phenomenon called hydrogen embrittlement. That means hydrogen permeates the surface of the metal, causing it to become slightly brittle. And in that case, the fault would be in the part, and it would be clear where the mistake was made. I also seized the torque wrench to have it tested. It was a high quality too with a recent calibra calibration certificate. Um, the metallurgic lab quickly responded, no problemo with the bolt. It was way over tightened, but there was no case of hydrogen embrittlement. Now, the metrological lab took a little longer, and it turned out that the torque wrench was out of spec in the lower range, just a little. Um, to be honest, it was even within the manufacturer's standard, but it was slightly off in the lower range. And there, that's where we found the problem. The tightening torques specified in the workshop manual are fairly low. 50 newton meters for the first step, then 50 newton meters, and finally 135 degrees of rotation. 
The torque wrench that was used was more suited for higher torques, as typically used in heavier equipment. And even though it was slightly off, the torque applied in the first two steps was higher than expected, and the following, following 135 degrees of rotation killed the bolt. Uh, I specifically asked the lab not to recalibrate the torque wrench, and when we installed the sprocket again to the camshaft, this time using the old bolt, we overstretched the old bolt too. There's this saying I often use, a bad craftsman always blames his tools. But I like to think that the opposite is true too. A decent craftsman can make things work with less than ideal tools. Lessons learned, don't always trust expensive tools and calibrations. Learn to work by feel. And also, never use threads, bolts and camshaft sprockets. Avoid certain German cars. That's all I have for this episode. Now back to our regular program, working on expensive Japanese cars with cheap tools. If you like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee. The link is in the description. As always, thanks for watching.